few years ago, my wife and I had the wonderful chance to visit the Amazon, the tropical rainforest. Amazing place. It floods from the Andes and you're on the river and you're passing along the river and you think you're actually watching the trees along the side of the river. Nope. The Amazon floods 30 feet. And so when you take your little canoe and go to the edge, you're actually in the tops of those trees. What else is in the tops of those trees? The iguanas, the big iguanas. So you're paddling right by them. There are big spiders. There are bigger ants. My wife was not really in her comfort envelope. <laughs> in fact, she wasn't in her comfort zip code there. <laughs> but the place is just absolutely amazing. That the tropics really have never been glaciated. They've been, a long, they've been there a long period of time. Many plants and animals are there. And it turns out that that's a very rich place for us in the world. And clearly, we need those forests for other purposes, and so they sometimes are logged. And so a very clever scientist at the Smithsonian actually asked the question, what happens to those forests if we log them and cut them into fragments? And so as it turns out, I'm going to talk tonight about the danger of fragmentation. And I'm going to use the forest as my first example. This is what Tom Lovejoy's experiments look like. He cut the forest into different squares, different sizes, different fragments, and then asked over time, what happens in those fragments? Well, as it turns out, the number of plants and animals decrease in those islands and those fragments. And furthermore, the smaller islands have a greater decrease in that biological diversity. And even more interesting, the farther apart the islands are, the greater the loss in diversity. So let's stop a minute. What did I just say? So do those little fragments actually predict the whole forest now? They don't. They've changed. So the fragments cannot predict the forest. Is there something different about the whole forest in those islands, those fragments? Yes, they've changed. So there's something in the whole forest that are not captured in those fragments. So that's the world today. About 100 years ago, people began to look at that and say, you know, it looks like, kind of like a puzzle. They also began to realize that on some parts of those continents, there were mountain ranges which were similar to mountain ranges in other parts of the other continents, yet they weren't quite lined up right. They began to look at fossils of plants and animals and found that in some places the edge of one continent had fossils very like another one, but they weren't quite lined up correctly. It turns out that during World War II, the submarine pilots had funny things happening to their compasses when they're near the bottom of the ocean. It turns also when we began to lay the transatlantic cables to have telegraphs between New York City and London, as they were playing out the cables, in some cases, a lot more cable was needed than necessary. Well, it could be that what? Those cables were going down some chasm, or it could be they were climbing up over mountains in the bottom of the ocean. And it turns out that as we began to think about the nuclear test ban, we put seismographs all over the world, and we began to realize that there are earthquakes on the bottom of the ocean. And furthermore, those earthquakes As it turns out, underneath the ocean, there are mountains, there are earthquakes, there are soft spots, there are hard spots. Put all that together, and what happens? You begin to see that those fragments don't actually predict the world today. That's what Pangaea looked like. 300 million years ago, that's what our globe looked like. And if you put those parts all together, those fragments, you can begin to draw the picture, which we now know is the theory of plate tectonics. We know that our continents actually move. I showed you that picture of the, of the continents moving around. There's a wonderful commentary which actually make it sound like, like a football game, like Africa blitzes up the middle, Australia goes around the left-hand side. <laughs> 
But the point I'm making here is that if you look at what's on the screen right now, none of those fragments can predict the whole. And yet you can't understand the whole without understanding the fragments. So I'm going to use these two analogies to talk about how we think about leading, how we think about making decisions, how we think about planning, how we think actually about understanding. Now, I've entitled this the danger of fragmentation. And I could have called this the implications of fragmentation or the insufficiencies of fragmentation. But the way we think and the way we plan and the way we lead and the way we make decisions is really important in terms of keeping track of the fragments. Now, when I showed you that globe just a minute ago in Pangaea with all the continents put together on one supercontinent, we had to have a theory to bring together all of those ideas. And the theory is not, as you sometimes hear, it's just a theory. I'm talking about a theory that is our best explanation for the facts that we know. And furthermore, that if the same conditions hold in the future, that same theory will tell us what's going to happen again. So we put enough facts together that we understand plate tectonics quite well now, and that's a very sort of solid theory. Now, some things you might not think about are theories. Gravity is a theory. You've never seen gravity. You can't go down aisle seven in Walmart and get a regular size gravity. Nobody's ever seen gravity. And yet what? That we have enough facts we put together that we understand that theory very well. And so the second point I'm going to say tonight is that as we think about how we plan and how we lead, being able to put those fragments together in a way that the theory makes sense is important to us. And it's interesting because if we put those facts together, those fragments together, to do something useful, we make better decisions. We make the right decisions. And furthermore, if we put all those fragments together, what that means is that people will understand what we're saying and will believe in it. So for all those reasons, that's why it's important for us to not neglect the fragments and to think about them really carefully. That's in spite of the fact that so much of the world today says, what? Keep it simple. Stupid. How many times have you heard that? Or they say, solve our problem by chunking it, putting it into parts. So there's a lot of language out there which really argues against considering all those fragments, using them, and being careful about how we actually use those. So if we think about sort of what's next, oh my goodness, that picture should be familiar. You just saw Simon. He's very interesting, actually. He's a British person. I grew up in Blackwell in Oklahoma. He grew up in Wimbledon. Somehow Wimbledon sounds a lot more elegant than Blackwell to me right now. He um, actually was, he's a very bright person, as you can tell. He traveled to South Africa and lived in South Africa spent some time in Hong Kong, and then came to the US. But I want to use this diagram here in a somewhat different way from the way he used it. And that is that if you think about that diagram of what, how, and why, what, how, and why are really fragments about how we think and plan. And so he focused on the value of the why and make sure that we really knew what we did and did it for a belief. So I'm going to add a third point here is now, and that is put the why in the story about why thinking about our fragments are so important for us. So what have I said so far? I've said, in fact, we need to look carefully at the fragments, understand that they don't predict the whole, but we can't understand the whole without the fragments. I've also talked about the idea of being able to bring this together in a theory so we understand those fragments. And then now I've added the idea of why to the theory as well. So what are the most dreaded words of your, of your boss? I suppose the most dreaded two words are you're fired, but a different set of dreaded words are what? Strategic planning. Strategic planning never really turns out the way you want it to, does it? And why doesn't it? Well, what happens? The loudest person in the room tends to prevail. The person who's the most persistent seems to sort of prevail. Or the person who you assume to be the expert, the loudest, and the most persistent, those all fail. But what happens? 
Well, you talk about ideas, and then you list ideas. Then you get multicolored dots. You put multicolored dots on a chart, and you add them up, right? What have I just said about fragments? They're just fragments. They're not in the theory, and they're not why. So I'm asking us to think about, as we think about the future of our state in Oklahoma, to think about it in a different kind of way. To really focus on the importance of all these fragments, because they really are important. And to realize they only make sense to us in terms of thinking carefully and planning and making decisions if we have some sort of theory to bring them together so we understand them. Actually, that globe I showed you is really kind of a model. Models are different things. They can be equations, they can be pictures, they can be diagrams, but the model then conveys what the theory says. And then lastly, to think really carefully about the why. Why are we doing this and why it's important? So a couple more examples here. Let's say for a minute you're about to start a business. You're a big-hearted person, and so your idea is you know, doctors use sutures. They sew up wounds with sutures. But you know, if we actually soak those in an antibiotic and use those kind of sutures, then what? Then you not only have the value of a suture, but you have an antibiotic at the same time. And that's really a good idea. You talk to your family, your family says, that's a terrific idea. You talk to a couple of friends, they say, that's a great idea. So what happens? You borrow money from your family, borrow money from your friends, you go talk to your family doctor, and he says, well, that's a really good idea. So what? You borrow more money, you mortgage your house, get a sales team in place, try to sell that product. It doesn't work. What happens? Some large pharmaceutical company is already doing that. Or it turns out your family doctor doesn't actually buy those sutures. The hospital does that. And so the issue here is that you've created a product but you don't understand really where that product's going. You don't understand who will buy that product. You don't understand actually what the sort of the transmission capabilities are of that. You don't understand the problems being solved necessarily. And so there was a group at Stanford who began this sort of lean launch idea. And the idea was that when you start something new, that instead of sort of building a product and going out and selling it, in a traditional kind of way, that you really should start with a good idea, sort of a minimum product perhaps, but you really need to talk to the consumers, discover what the customer's thinking before you invest in that kind of money. And so lean launch means that you don't spend all the money up front sort of developing the ultimate device or developing a huge kind of marketing strategy or, or process. You actually try and understand what your customer needs, a dis uh, discovery from their customers, and then you modify your project to match the needs of your customer. So you're wondering where I'm going. This is the, this is the canvas. This is the model. How many times have you had speakers say, don't look at the details? I'm saying look at the details tonight. Because this brings together the same kind of thoughts we've talked about, that in the center there's a a little rectangle there that says value proposition. And then if you look to one side, you can see customer segments. You can see channels. You can on the left-hand side say, OK, who are the key partners? Or you can say, what are my revenue streams? Those are all fragments. And this chart is a theory about how to put those together. It would be a better model, actually, if we had arrows that went from the value proposition to the customer segments through the channels, for example. But the point I'm making here is that when, in fact, we're trying to do something new and be creative, understanding the key fragments and how they go together is a really important part. And so this sort of lean launch that actually comes out of the business world is really a good guide for us to think about the points that I've made tonight. That may not look like an interesting model. Put arrows on and think about that. And then think about, gosh, what if I actually animated the arrows? That's the kind of vision that, in fact, we need when you think about where Oklahoma is going and what's possible. Last point. So when we think about what we're trying to accomplish, 
This idea actually came out of the business world as well. And the idea was that we should think about the triple bottom line here. That is, we tend to think about the money part. That's the profit. And we can judge that pretty carefully. We can talk about capitalization, or we can talk about equity, or we can talk about the price of stocks today. But frequently, we don't consider the environmental concern. That's the planet concern. And we don't think about the social concerns. And so as we're thinking about all these fragments, putting together in theory, and trying to think about why it's important to us, thinking about not just one bottom line, but in this case, triple bottom line. That is, before we make a decision, before we devise a plan, to think about what the consequence is in terms of economics, sure. Think about it in terms of what it means to our planet, yes. And what about our people? So one of the reasons that ideas don't take hold is that they may be a good idea, but we haven't taken enough time to understand what the implication is to the planet, whether people agree with it, whether it will disadvantage them socially or not. So the sort of triple bottom line makes us think about the outcomes in terms of not just a singular outcome, but in fact a more comprehensive out outcome. And in fact, those are three fragments. So what I've tried to say tonight is, we in Oklahoma have this wonderful opportunity. We're thinking about what Oklahoma can look like 20 years from now. And we can do it in the sort of traditional way with flip charts and colored dots. Or we can step back and say, let's think about this in a different kind of way. Let's realize that those fragments really are important. And we really can't predict the whole from just parts of it. And furthermore, if we don't understand all the parts, we can't predict the whole. We can't put those fragments together without having some sort of overarching theory to actually make sense of it, and a model to actually convey the vision of what that looks like. We can't be compelling unless we know why. And lastly, we can't be right unless we consider the people, the planet, and profit. Thank you very much. <laughs>